I first met Larry when I was I had just gotten out of my tour of duty in the army. It was December of 1971, and uh, I was married. We had a child and needed a job, and uh, I interviewed with uh, with him and John Wilson. I mean, my impression with Larry was uh, uh, he was um, obviously a high, even at that point in time, early on, highly skilled in what he did, uh, and um, having just been in the army for two years. Um, I needed a lot of training, and um, he 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 had a I mean, among other things, he had a great smile, and um, uh, and it was easy to establish a relationship with him. And you know, he became my mentor uh, along with John Wilson, and uh, took somebody that was uh, about as green as his uh, army suit, and uh, you know, made made much of my career possible, like he's done for many people here. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a warmth to Larry that, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure everybody sees all the time. And, um, and so, you know, we've been friends and partners for 44 years now. And, and that's been a, that, that's been a great, uh, a great joy and a great privilege for me, actually. Well, if you take Silicon Valley, um, and you take, literally silicon, um, you could benchmark the last 50 years or 50 years of the valley um, in a number of ways. One way you could take Bob Noyce, uh, the co-inventor of the integrated circuit at, and then the founder of Intel and, and Steve Jobs. And of, of course the valley had a prior history in technology with uh, the wireless radio and the vacuum tube, etc. But you know the silicon in Silicon Valley was based upon the semiconductor industry, and um, of course there's many people you know involved in that and in between that. But if you were just to pick kind of two icons, you could have uh, from the '60s Bob Noyce and and up through 2011, I guess when Steve Jobs died. Uh, if you think about what happened in those 50 years, uh, it's it's probably one of the most innovative periods in American history, maybe in any economic history, where the integrated circuit and the microprocessor enabled the PC, uh, it enabled the internet, telecommunications, and ultimately the personal devices. And when you move that forward to, you know, uh, Steve Jobs and Apple, uh, you had this global digital economy and, and where uh, computers were not just used for processing data, but for, you know, music, entertainment, social media, uh, all on a mobile device of some sort. And um, I think Larry had a very unique role in that, in that as a, a lawyer and more broadly as a business advisor, uh, I think he comfortably fits in uh, which which you're recognizing him for, he fits in with um, you know the, the the key people who were part of that journey and, and of that revolution, and um, uh, it's a very it's it, it's a very unique role uh, that he and others played, and and of course the firm uh, benefited from that, and uh, we've been very fortunate in a number of ways, but. Um, I, I think if you look at it that way, uh, uh, it, it's a pretty interesting story. Well, I think one of the extraordinary things, um, and this just goes back, is that um, Larry created a practice of, of doing public securities work, IPOs, um, and, and beyond that. And... Um, he really didn't have uh, a mentor that had done that. Uh, when he came to the firm as the first associate in 1966, he developed that practice. And, and, you know, that would be unheard of today, really, would be for someone to start out as a, as a raw uh, attorney out of law school to, to develop uh, uh, that kind of a practice. And... Um, and I think, in, in I, as I look back on those years in dealing with large firms at the time, uh, I think he got the immediate respect of 
of his peers because what he was doing was was highly uh, highly unusual. Um, and you know we had some uh, interesting things along the way where um, uh, we were operating at levels that. Um, not so much him, but others, we were operating at lever levels far beyond what uh, anybody would be allowed to work on today. And, you know, that if you, you know, the 70s were a pretty down period economically, but if, if you take after the commercialization of the microprocessor, and if you look at the period of 1980 to 2000, for example, um, and again, if you pick some benchmarks, you had the Apple IPO, which, of course, he was intimately involved in, uh, there was a company called Rome, which was really at the center of, of the first digital PBX in the telecommunication, telecommunications industry. Uh, and they did their coming out party as they had gone public before doing um, mil-spec computers. But uh, those two offerings in 1980, uh, the Rome offering of $100 million, which was a lot of money in 1980, um, as a you know, as a telecommunications company, and uh, the Apple IPO, and both of those firms, uh, both of those companies could have hired any law firm in the country. And in 1980, uh, we were probably 25 lawyers, and so for those for those two companies, because uh, they were the Google of their day, uh, to hire Larry uh, and us is a real testament to. Uh, uh, to what he uh, had, by even by that time, created here. Well, I'd, I'd mention two things. Um, one's very personal in nature, is that he's been a great friend, not only a mentor, but a great friend and partner. And, you know, life has its ups and downs. And um, he's always been somebody, uh, for me and others, that, that you could count on, and I could count on personally to be there. Um, you know when when you when I needed him, he's also and, and people don't see this because they typically see him in the business context. Um, you know he's a loving and supportive husband to Barbara and father to his three children and and uh, um, uh, and I think that's an important. I know that's an important part of his of his life. I think the other area I would touch on is is the firm, which may be you know, too specific for what you're thinking about. But when, when you think about um, what he did here and, and, you know, the firm began with John Wilson and John had a, a vision of, of, of being more than a suburban law firm and representing these technology companies. And Larry took that and, and really broadened it and enhanced it. And, and, and so we very early on, uh, through him had this vision of becoming a full service firm and, and representing um, the, these companies at all stages of growth. And he, it's become lore right now. And, and I can almost remember when he did it. And I actually think it was in a restaurant, but you know, like an architect that uh, designs his, his uh, signature building on a napkin or a single piece of paper, Larry sat down and, and I don't know if you've seen this, but he drew three circles and, and they went up and to the right and each circle represented, um, you know, the, the principal areas of growth of targets of our client base, the, the, the startup company uh, to the later stage company in the first circle and the IPO and the, and the early younger public company and then in the third circle, um, the multi-billion dollar national global enterprise. And and then he drew a line through it, a diagonal line through it. And like branches off the trunks of a tree, he he listed the disciplines in the areas that we needed to uh, make sure we had covered in, in order to uh, in order to meet that challenge. And so he set out the vision, he set out the strategy and the goals, and it it was you know, it was almost pure in its its simplicity and its clarity, and yet it was it was very bold and even uh, you know there's a lot of audacity there to think that this small firm could do this, and uh, and and you know we have followed that uh, fundamentally for you know for 40 50 years, and he, the other thing that's an important piece of that is. Um, 
you know, he de he describes it. You know, we have our our cultural values of of one, you know, of diversity and meritocracy and and consensus um, uh, managing by consensus. Uh, but w the other one is is what he articulated as freedom of practice, and and what that means is is that you know as long as you buy into the vision and the strategy. Um, as a lawyer, as a participant in that, you have a great deal of freedom as to how you practice law and how you do that. Well, that's a very uh, almost intoxicating thing. I mean, it's, it's what good companies do. The, you give people the, the room to run and to create. And as a result of that, uh, I think we've attracted just great people and it's been an incentive for them to stay because it's allowed them, you know, for example, we built up an M&A practice, and off of that, it became clear that we needed to have a, a great antitrust practice. And, and young young people at the firm took that and ran with that and built that. And it's the same thing with our branch offices. And, um, you know, the Romans had this thing they called the genius of the place, which is th this th this element of, of, of what makes institutions great. Uh, and, and, um, and so, you know, having someone that is, you know, has as big a presence as, as Larry has to, you know, to create an atmosphere where people had that freedom of practice. Um, uh, and I think, you know, great companies do that too. And, and, um, I think, I think that's a very, uh, uh, I think that's a very unique thing he brought to the firm. And I think it's been key to why it's prospered. Larry, it's been a great run for 44 years. Uh, you've been a great friend and partner and mentor. Uh, and this award for the Global Silicon Valley Hall of Fame uh, is well deserved. Um, you're in good company uh, with Bill Campbell and Dick Kramlick. And um, congratulations, it's well deserved. Um, what you've done for uh, the Valley and technology companies and, and this firm um, is, is really outstanding.